So good morning. Uh, my name is J.C. Nolan, and, and I'm really happy to be here today to speak to you about such an important topic as information sharing um, in, in the, between the public and the private sector. And I was really looking forward to meeting many of you in Miami in the absence of the in-person event. Uh, I'm very thankful that we can still have the opportunity to meet here, even if it is virtually. So today I'm going to discuss a critically important topic, and that is the significant progress that has been made in the aviation sector as far as threat-related information sharing between the U.S. government um, and the aviation industry. So for the last six years, um, I have been working on this, the first four and a half being at TSA and the last two being uh, the senior director um, of Intel and Security for Atlas Air. So I've got a unique perspective on this, um, being that I've done it from both sides now. So <clears throat> at Atlas Air, we believe that our business starts with the customer and, and really our core values are safety, security, and compliance. And, and we're in a very good position right now because from our CEO down through our executive staff, um, you know, security is really a foundation of our company. And we also have the luxury of having not only an innovative leader as our vice president of global, oper global security, but a real, uh, a highly diverse um, team of professionals that come from backgrounds like the DEA, the Marines, the Army, the Intel community, the airline industry, academia, and even the fire department. So I, I really am truly grateful to work with such a talented group of individuals. So just a little bit about us um, at Atlas Air. So uh, for over 25 years, we've been providing uh, charter and freight and passenger services, um, servicing over 400 destinations in more than 90 countries. And that was last year. Uh, our business lines include military charters, e-commerce, heavy lift, express, and passenger charter operations. And we like to consider ourselves an inventive, adaptive, and forward-thinking global provider. So here you'll see a map, and these are some of our destinations. Uh, again, a significant portion of what we do is unscheduled service and charter operations. So you're not seeing the 400 destinations here, but, but, but they are there. And then right here is, is a list of our customers, uh, just some of our customers um, that, that we work with. Um, so hopefully that'll give you an idea of how kind of large our, our global footprint is. So to level set, um, as I begin the topic, uh, the presentation on information sharing, I, I would just like to introduce for transparency uh, the agencies who, in, in our opinion, have really championed the public-private sector information sharing initiatives. Uh, and more than just recognizing these agencies or groups within the agencies have stood shoulder to shoulder with us uh, as we've kind of navigated the, the next generation of, of what this information sharing model is going to look like. Uh, so just to recognize, and, and in no particular order, because they, they each have different missions and scopes, uh, the Department of State's Overseas Advisory Council, or OSAC, the FAA's Intelligence Threat and Analysis Division, um, and then TSA's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, um, as well as the ADAC, uh, or the Air Domain Intelligence Integration and Analysis Cell. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to, to the ADAC. Um, in, a, in a couple minutes. But these three entities have really kind of set the bar for what right looks like, in our opinion, um, in the space of information. And, and they really do have a lot of thought leaders um, recognizing the internet interconnectedness of the aviation system. So what conditions have made us successful? And, and I say made us successful because we have made significant progress in the last, you know, particularly two years. Um, and in previous years, I have given variations of this talk, kind of always focusing on the, the changing the model of how we share information, right? So this shifting paradigm. Uh, but the progress has been steady, and therefore, I think we do now have a model. Um, and, and really, what we're doing now is upgrading the model that we have. So I think that, that this began, um, this kind of journey began with an education process for both the government and the airline industry. And I would say about five years ago, if I had to summarize how the conversations went between between the industry and the government, and, and five years ago I was on the government side, it was, you know, industry kind of asking us what information we had, and us going back to the industry and saying, well, what do you need? And and then nobody kind of knew what the other needed or had. Um, so I like to tell this story because I think it exemplifies kind of the progress that we've made. So in 2015, January of 2015. 
I became the branch manager of TH, TSA's um, strategic analysis branch in the Office of Intelligence and Analysis. And quite early in my tenure in that position, I was approached by my boss and he asked uh, why we, our branch of 23 analysts, weren't supporting the industry. And I kind of looked at him with, with some shock and I said, I'm, sir, I'm not, I'm not really understanding what you're talking about. And he said, well, um, uh, you know, a head of security for an airline called and he doesn't feel like that they're getting the information. Uh, so immediately I, I sat down and, you know, I called this individual and kind of like in a big booming voice, he said um, what his expectations were uh, of us as, you know, an Intel provider. And, and then he said, before you do anything, I need you to get on a plane and come out here um, to see the hub and, and see what our operation is. I didn't really know what to expect, but I did trust this individual. And I was amazed, though, probably not at the time, that, that I had been almost three years into my TSA career before I had actually seen the inside of an airplane, uh, not as a passenger. I had never seen an airline operations center, and I had never seen a cargo warehouse. So from my first visit to that airline, I understood that what I did not know was a lot. Um, and I had another senior uh, aviation official or officer um, tell me, he said to me, you know, in a, a very direct way, and it really resonated with me. He said, um, he challenged me not to give him what I think he needed, but rather to give him what he knew he needed. So he was going to help me understand what he needed. And that would make me uh, or, or my, uh, you know, the staff at, at TSA do a better job of providing the relevant and the timely information. Uh, so over the next few years at TSA and also, um, you know, concurrently, this was happening with the FAA Intel team. Uh, the analysts were going out into the field to meet with the airline teams. Uh, personal connections were made, and, and, and we really made an effort to understand the industry. So while we conducted these site visits, we made it a point to invite the airline, the airports, and the aviation associations to join us um, at the government in, in a classified setting um, to go over briefings on, you know, at the time it was terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, and I know that up until COVID-19, the outbreak, these information exchanges and site visits were still happening. Um, and, and I do say, you know, to this day, these trusted partnerships continue to develop. Uh, so the second thing that, that took place, and it's still happening, was the recognition of who needs to know what and when they need to know it. Um, in the Intel world, these are known as priority intelligence requirements. And really, the function of a PIR is to identify what a customer needs and then from the government side, what collection assets to put against the requirements. This process has taken several years. Uh, again, I mean, I started with this on the government side, and, and now I've been involved with it on the industry side. Um, but we, I think that, that we've made enough progress where now we really do kind of have a template, and there is a mutual understanding and recognition of, of, of what the industry needs are. Uh, so I don't have to go into the background of TSA. Um, you know, founded after the, the, the attacks of 9-11, um, you know, with the key focus of preventing um, another catastrophic, uh, you know, attack on the United States. And uh, in the aviation sector, quite frankly, there's nothing more unimaginable right now than another attack. And, and we can all agree that the, the consequences would be catastrophic. And, and again, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, a, an attack on on, on one airplane is kind of attack on the entire aviation um, uh, sector. So what has not changed since 9-11 is the adversary's intent and capability to target aviation. Uh, so although groups and leaders and, and locations may change for these different terrorist groups, their ability to adapt, innovate, and find ways to circumvent aviation security measures continues. Uh, just look at the printer cartridge plot of 2010, Metrojet in 2015, Dalo Airlines Flight 159 in 2016, and then the Meat Grinder plot in 2017. So while artfully concealed explosive devices on board aircraft is, is, again, our worst case scenario, the vast majority of our security concerns begin when the plane lands um, at whatever the destination is. Different threat levels um, at the locations based on terrorist group, I, different identified vulnerabilities at hotels, cultures, customs, languages the potential risk of political instability and civil unrest, the ever-changing requirements around COVID-19 now. All of these factors are now considered uh, in our risk ratings. Um, so you see the, the problem is now much more expansive than just the, the traditional bomb on a plane. So as we sat down with our government counterparts to discuss the PIRs, the above considerations were suggested and accepted. 
Um, again, and this is part to the in part due to the education process that I spoke about a few minutes ago, and that's letting our trusted partners know what was important and why it was important. So the positive of this effort was that there are different government agencies now analyzing the above topics, um, and now it's just kind of a matter of, of collating the information and dissemination. Um, but you know, again, these these different agencies have different mission sets and. Uh, you know, for TSA, it's counterterrorism. For the FA, it's airspace. For, say, the Department of State, uh, focusing on more of the internal atmospherics of the different countries. But I really want to emphasize something. This is not a this is not a one way uh, street or, or a one way concept, right? So the airline industry, I think, really has a has a responsibility to give back to the government. So we have data sets that the government does not have access to. And for some examples, that would be suspicious activity reports crew members, um, local station managers who have insights because they live in the towns and the cities, and additionally, our private intelligence providers who have access to information that the U.S. government would not just because of where they're placed around the world. In addition to this type of information, we can also provide other information, um, for example, flight routes, hotels, SOPs. Um, and all, all of this is to really help the, the government fill in the gaps um, and get a more complete and comprehensive picture of, of the aviation security world. And a great example of this, and you know, this is currently ongoing, um, and it's first so very timely, is the, the uh, problems right now in the Nagorno-Karabakh region between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, significant concerns right now about the airspace routes over over that region. And uh, there have been some several open source uh, articles about potentially planes being shot down. Um, there's considerable drone activity in the area. So um, again, you know, those flight routes, you know, to the government give them an awareness of, you know, where we are flying around the world. Uh, so an often asked question from the government, uh, you know, it, and it's much less now this question is asked, but like, why do you need to know the information? And the answer is quite simple. Uh, based on the information that we receive, we as the airlines can operationalize it to make time-sensitive security decisions. So I'm going to give you an example, um, and this is from May of 2019, but I think it's, there's other examples since then, but I think that this really uh, kind of hits home on, on the point of these trusted partnerships. So uh, Atlas was awarded a, a short notice mission to operate in an area of the world where where there was a very high terrorism threat, and that was both from uh, indigenous groups and then transnational uh, actors. Uh, so this particular flight would require a crew rest, uh, a rest overnight um, in, this, in this area. So as a security department, when we get these different stations, obviously we do our due diligence and you know, we work with a, a number of, of different um, agencies and like I said, private intel providers to kind of assess the risk. Um, and then weigh it against our risk appetite. Uh, so from the time that, that we were made aware that this flight was, was happening until the time the decision had to be made was roughly 72 hours. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, we were at a conference and we did not have access to the classified environment. Uh, so due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, at the time, our security department at Atlas did not have access to the classified information. Um, so as it came down to the wire, really what we needed was, is there information that we would need to see that would impact our, our flight into this area of the world? And, um, and again, we couldn't see the information, but we got basically the, the, the green light, red light, right? That was the situation that we were in. And because of these trusted partnerships, uh, you know, my, my boss was able to make a, a time sensitive security decision and without seeing the information, but again, it was this relationship that we had built. And, and finally, the next day when we were able to see the reporting, it was after the mission had already taken place and, and it was the right call to make um, at the time. Uh, so I could cite at least 22 national level directives um, on government and industry intelligence sharing dating back to 1980, I'm sorry, 1981, uh, when Ronald Reagan signed 1233. Uh, so now the easy part of this complex problem is not finding the mandates that say thou shalt share the information, but it's really addressing kind of the how to share the information. So at present, the aviation industry can participate and, and 
this is every week. At present, we can participate in at least six weekly phone calls with our government partners to discuss the threat environment around the world. And, and these have increased since COVID-19. Um, and these six weekly calls do not include scheduled calls um, among different working groups that, that we participate in with our government partners um, and also does not account for um, in instances where we pick up the phone and have a request for information from a specific agency. So there are a lot of opportunities right now for us in the aviation sector to communicate with our government partners. Um, one such way is the ADAC, which I mentioned before. So it's sponsored by the Director of National Intelligence. Um, it's located at TSA. And I think right now, latest statistics, there are close to 500 participants um, across 36 agencies uh, and 62 industry organizations. So I think that that's, that's really a significant showing of, of partnership and collaboration. Um, so again, a great job there with the ADAC. Uh, I just want to touch on uh, just a couple of the challenges um, that we face. Uh, so one is institutional challenges. Two is, you know, the trusted partnerships. Three is technical challenges. And the fourth one I would like to add right now um, that has become a little bit more apparent during COVID-19 is just that of, that of inaction, right? And I'm, I'm going to get to that. Um, but institutional challenges are not unique in this space, right? And, and, and for years, we've kind of been battling the mindset of, well, this is the way we've always done it as far as information sharing. And it, you know, so far it's worked. Um, you know, and, and for, for a lot in government, um, again, much less so now, but we, the, the aviation industry wasn't really considered a customer. Um, we were kind of you know, the other. Um, and as a former Intel officer, I'm acutely aware of you know, the sensitivity surrounding the who I got the information from and how I got the information. But at Atlas Air, we've had a consistent message when we hear this concern. Um, who you receive the information from and the means by which you acquired that information are really kind of irrelevant to us. Our only concern is that we can mitigate potential threats based on actionable intelligence. Um, you know, and, and in the anecdotal, um, you know, the, the, the anecdotal evidence that we have really kind of gives that feedback to the government that, hey, listen, if you provide us the information, we can operationalize and potentially save lives. Um, so I think that, that, again, the government is starting to, to, to a much higher degree see the value in, in the sharing of of intelligence with us. Um, trusted partners, again, I think they've improved significantly. Um, and this, again, is in large part uh, due to the aviation sector coming to the table with the government and, and you know, giving them additional information to kind of help them help us. Um, and again, it's what, what locations your airline is operating to, inviting the airlines to participate uh, or to, to see your operation centers, your cargo warehouses, understand how you conduct risk assessments, um, and then demonstrating to the government partners how you as the airline operation, operationalize the information. Technical challenges are, that's a hardware and a software issue, and we're going to continue uh, to, to deal with these. But again, it's, it's very tough once you get outside of the, the Washington, D.C. Beltway to have access often to classified information. So, um, you know, there's several initiatives going on there uh, to improve that capability at the, the um, headquarters locations uh, of the different um, airlines. Um, but again, that's still a work in progress. And, and you know, again, that's, that's a financial issue, right? So, so it's gonna take, uh, you know, money to, to purchase some of the systems, the more up-to-date systems where we can more closely collaborate on an unclassified and classified network. Uh, so the fourth challenge is inaction. Um, and like I said, in 2019, we had considerable conversations um, between the government, the airlines, the airports, the aviation associations on how we do better. Um, one initiative is, is uh, it's called the NAI 2.0. And, and really they've been, um, they've been kind of one of the, the organizations that has tried to bring industry and government together uh, to kind of to create what they call is a single integrated team between the government and the industry. Um, and that partnership would close analytic and collection gaps um, to operate on a much more streamlined manner. So 
from 2019 and coming into 2020, there was a lot of momentum um, from the in-person conferences that we were having, delving into you know, the successes that we've had in the areas for development. Now with COVID-19, it's certainly understandable priorities and resources have been redirected. Uh, the industry on a global scale has been impacted severely and our initiatives have been put on hold to a great extent. But my hope is, um, you know, and I would appeal to to my industry partners and, and you know, the government partners, uh, that we can continue these conversations um, on how to improve despite the work not taking place in person. So in conclusion, I just want to say that this is a critically important issue um, and progress is being made. Leaders from both the government and the industry, we've really kind of moved away from this idea of, um, you know, stop telling me why we can't do this and let's start having the conversation about how we are going to do this. This business is way too important um, for us to not be all on the same team. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and I look forward to fielding any questions um, in the panel session.